Welcome to Great Business Stories, and today's episode is called Branson's Triumph, the inside story of the British Airways Virgin Atlantic Dirty Tricks campaign. In this episode, myself and Keith do a deep dive into one of the biggest business scandals of the 1980s when British Airways financed a dirty tricks campaign in an attempt to really publicly blacken Richard Branson's name and also to put his fledgling airline out of business. So we find out why Richard Branson got into the airline business and how he managed to get under the skin of British Airways. We also discuss why British Airways, which back then was one of the biggest and most respected companies at that time, why it decided to wage a dirty tricks campaign against Branson's tiny new airline. And also, who were the people within BA behind it all? It's a cracking story, and we hope you enjoy it as well. So, good morning. Morning, Keith. Good morning. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Today we're doing the uh, Dirty Tricks campaign. The British Airways, I probably would probably refer to them as BA during the, the episode, mm. and Virgin Atlantic. And it was you who chose this story. So why this story? Well, I guess Branson is a, a larger, larger than life sort of character. And he would have kind of been bubbling around anybody with any interest in businesses. I suppose this one was really a, a David Goliath story, which always sort of piques the interest. And it's quite well known. So I just thought it might be an interesting one to to kind of dig a little bit deeper into. So I knew from a superficial level, I knew about the court cases and stuff. But I did really want to learn more about the story. So it was a good opportunity to dig into it and find a little bit more about these characters and who the main movers and shakers were. So I found some interesting people less famous than Branson along the way as well. Yeah, it wasn't. And it's interesting you say David and Goliath, because uh, when I was making my notes, that's exactly the way I was up as well. And I suppose for people who mightn't be familiar with it, I mean, it, over here, I know on this side of the Atlantic, it was one of the biggest scandals of the time. Yeah. But I, I did do some research. And it was widely reported over in America as well. But I suppose to, to give the, the listeners an overview of it, we're, we're going back to the late 80s, early 90s. And at the time, British Airways were the big beast in the airline yeah. business. Their tagline was the world's favorite airline and they were in terms of passenger numbers they were big and then you had virgin atlantic which was started up by richard branson and it was the up part the, the cheeky airline and branson got under the skin of lord king who we'll talk about he was the chairman of ba yeah. and virgin was seen as as a credible threat despite its size it was tiny it was still seen as a credible threat by ba so mm-hmm. between getting under the skin of lord king and being seen as a threat BA started what became known as the Dirty Tricks campaign, where they try to undermine Branson and smear his name really publicly, while also try to just take his business away from him. And yeah. that's what became known as Dirty Tricks. And it was Dirty Tricks when you read it. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I think the, the book I read is by Martin Gregory. And this yeah. story really seems to have gotten under his, his skin and captured his attention. And he's had tremendous access to some of these characters, interesting characters that emerged through the story, which we'll touch on as well. And he's done some TV shows, the World in Action show as well, which is available on YouTube if anybody wanted to check that out. The World in Action was a good well. one. The, yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's very good. Um, but it seems to, yeah, so I guess we can dig into it. We can dig into it. And before we just dig into it, I wanted to give our, our listeners sort of an overview because the airline business back in the, late 80s, early 90s, was a lot different to the airline yeah. business that we know of now. Just some of the differences that, that I read about was that, first of all, it was a lot more glamorous. If you were flying first class or business class back then, you had to dress in a suit. It was expected. <laughs> Economy class came with free alcohol. Every flight came with a hot meal. Uh, you could check in no, way quicker, of course, no security. Yeah, yeah like walk that. up to the gate nearly. You could, you actually could go up to the gate. You could see off people yeah. at the gate as well. You could also, go, of course, go into the cockpit if you wanted to, you know, or if little Johnny wanted to go and see the pilot, he was allowed <laughs> to. Now, on the negative side, it was very expensive. I mean, you look at it today, you can fly return New York, London for under $1,000, whereas in 1980s, you were looking at often over $2,500. But again, I look back further in like 1970s, it was about 3100 return. But the biggest thing back in the 80s and 90s was that you could smoke on planes as well, which is crazy. Yeah, I can remember they had, they, they had these no smoking areas, which was a joke, really, when you think about it. I know. It's all recycled air. You're stuck on a plane like... <laughs> No, I think in uh, in the US, 
that all finished in 2000. It was gradual. They sort of brought it in that for flights under six hours. But it was eventually 2000 where it was stopped completely in the US. British Airways stopped smoking completely in 1998. Um, so th- there was a lot of differences. You can see it's radically consolidated over the last 20 or 30 years. And then you had the low-cost airlines, which changed the whole psyche of flying. It's no longer seen as glamorous. It's nearly seen as like yeah. you know, just getting from so, A to B as cheap as you can. And would you have been aware of Branson? Would he have been in your head as well oh, when you were growing up? Very much so, very much so. The first time I saw Branson was, I reckon I was 14 at the time, because I looked back at oh. it and he was interviewed on the Late Late Show when the Virgin Megastore opened in Dublin. Oh, and that was back in 1986. And right. I remember he made a big impression on me for two reasons on that show. First of all, he was very charismatic. He had the, the big hair, the big teeth, very outgoing, very charming. Um, but he didn't wear a suit and he never wore a suit. He wore a jumper and jeans back then was his go-to uniform. And back then, every businessman wore, wore a suit. Yeah, oh, I think actually uh, Lord King christened him the grinning pullover. <laughs> He was grinning. He was always had this big smile and his big teeth. Um, but another thing that struck me about him uh, on the Late Late Show, I remember the interview. Uh, the Late Late Show, for people who aren't familiar with it, is uh, a talk show in Ireland that is still going. And I think it's the second longest running talk show in the world after mm-hmm. the Late Show in America. So it's a big focal point for the Irish people, especially back then when you only had two channels. But he really made business kind of sound fun it yes. kind of like an adventure here was this guy dressed in jeans and jumper and just talking about the fun he had setting up his businesses yeah and, and he so seemed th- like a swashbuckling sort of a pirate character who was taking on the big guys yeah i mean you you'd be familiar you probably read some of his books as well i guess i did and i read losing my virginity and there were inspirational books at the time yeah it seemed to be in a constant state of, of flux really he was going from battling a competitor to developing a new business. And I would encounter various different brands. I can remember his cola. Um, yeah. And there's a good story one. in the cola one itself. Like. Yeah, I think as well, um, he started selling condoms in the Virgin Mega store. That caused and loads of condoms. They were, they were legal here. They were called they were meats, illegal. wasn't it? That's right, yeah. And that caused huge controversy as well. Yeah, but great for PR as well, which is part of the reason why he did a lot of things. Free publicity. Yes, you know, and facing advertising. himself very much front and centre. That's one yeah. of the things that I noted was that the Virgin brand was built around Branson to promote yes. this image of cheekiness, anti-establishment. You all this kind of stuff. And Branson was front and center of all that. Like, yeah. 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 And I think, I think that's probably what brought things to a head, or at least it's attributed to it. At the, the outbreak of Gulf War, there was a lot of British citizens, obviously, in Iraq and Kuwait. And um, Branson repurposed all of his flights to rescue these people. Yes. And got a lot of public. Apparently, that was one of the trigger points for Lord King to pursue Branson. It was it was one of the major trigger points. There was a good few things that happened up to that point that enraged Lord King. And I suppose we, we'd better talk about this guy as well, because we mentioned that it was a David versus Goliath story. But behind both airlines was two huge personalities, Branson being one who most of us are familiar with. But it's this other character, Lord John King, who most people, well, outside of England anyway, and probably if you weren't a, a Tory, you probably wouldn't be familiar yeah. with him. I read a lot of interviews with him. I watched a lot of video with him. There's a great four-part documentary on uh, British Airways, which you can find on YouTube. Really? Yeah, and oh. one whole episode is 50 minutes long, is dedicated just to Lord John King. So you get a good idea of what he's like. And initially, he comes across, well, let me go back to who he is. He's this guy who was born in very, very, not even modest circumstances, very working class, had a ton of self-belief. Always, I don't think he ever doubted himself, is the Mm. impression I got of him. Started up his own businesses, made a bit of money uh, repurposing Vickers engines during World War II for the planes. Really made his first bit of decent cash when he started up a ball bearing company. That's right. And as he said at the time, ball bearings, why go into ball bearings? He said, well, they're one of the most simple products in the world to make. And for me, that really shows what kind of character he was. He was extremely pragmatic, you know, above and beyond yes. anything else. He was a pragmatic. He didn't complicate stuff at all. And 
He sold that ball bearing company then for three million back in 1969. I use measuringworth.com, which is a really good tool to measure how much something was worth historically. And three million back in 1969 is the equivalent of about 150 million in today's money. So uh, he made a nice chunk of change out of that. Um, that certainly would seem to tally with the public kind of perception of him as landed gentry type person. That what well, a cash would lend that itself to that sort of lives. This is it. And when you see the interviews with him, he talks very grandly. He but, lived on a country estate. He had his own right. cricket ground and his own cricket team. So he comes across as this very establishment figure. But, you know, his his background isn't establishment. He very much is a working class fella. And it was then after making his money, he became chairman of a few other businesses. I think Babcock yeah. or something like that. And started making his name as this great industrial businessman. And it was around this time then that the Thatcher government were in power. And one of their big driving forces or themes was to take these big, unprofitable, unionized, state-owned businesses to try and turn them around, privatize them, yes. make a success of them. While at the same time, if you can crush all the unions while doing that, all the better, I think, was very much their playbook. And they approached Lord John King in 1981 to take over BA to become chairman of BA. So that's, the, uh, yeah, and you she, read the book on him as well. So you yeah, it's, it, it seems that they had a very good relationship, Thatcher and King. So he was often called her favorite business yeah. person. And she saw him as an enabler of this privatization strategy, yeah. I think. And of course, the jewel in the crown was BA. So uh, I guess you had governmental pressure coming to bear in what was called the dirty trick war with this government agenda to try and get the business profitable, get it privatized, point to free enterprise as well. We're talking about the Reagan era as well. And I think just one of the interesting stories that's bubbling around here just before the BA um, situation is Laker Airlines. So Laker Airlines um, were um, Sir, Sir Freddie Laker, and they were a big international threat as well, and that ended up in the courts. And Laker went to the American courts. And what's interesting there was that Thatcher and Reagan met privately to discuss the Justice Department's oh, treatment of Laker. Yeah. yeah. And they essentially, Reagan was able to call off the dogs from a legal perspective. And Laker did have a legal settlement and became a very important kind of sounding board and advisor to Branson yeah. over time. But I think it could have been kind of a lot more serious and a lot more expensive for BA. And perhaps if, if things had followed their natural course, it could be our, the dirty tricks sort of situation would not have arisen at all. But uh, interestingly enough, one of the side notes in the book was that there was a considerable amount of fear at the time when Reagan and Thatcher were meeting, that they might have an agreement. And then Reagan, who was obviously suffering from health issues at the yeah. time, would promptly forget what was discussed on a one-on-one. -on -one. Right. So they were concerned about any sort of agreements that would be made because he'd promptly forget them. And this is what, was this where BA, I, I, I only know the, the sort of headline figures in this, this is where BA and uh, Pan Am and a few other airlines kind of nobbled Freddie Laker by having some sort of price fixing cartel, was that it? Apologies for the interruption. I'd like to tell you very quickly how we plan to grow great business stories, how you can help us and what you'll get in return. Due to the huge amount of research undertaken for each episode, for now we can release only one episode on the first of every month. But if we can get enough supporters to donate just $3 per month, we'll be able to release a second episode every month. This second monthly episode will be behind a paywall, but your $3 monthly subscription will give you access to these episodes when we eventually release them. So that's what we're building towards, but for now, when you subscribe for $3 a month, you get the following benefits. You get to listen to great business stories without hearing this message. You get access to one bonus episode. It's a cracking story called the $4.5 billion 1MDB heist, how Joe Lowe and the Prime Minister stole a fortune. And finally, as a supporter on the first of every month, the same day that we release a new episode, you'll get one email with one link to an amazing in-depth article exploring a great story. 
And while our Twitter feed, which is at Biz, B-I-Z, Story Podcast, regularly shares links to great business stories, the one delivered via email will be a bit special. So to help us release two episodes a month, to listen to that bonus episode, and to receive a link to a great business story article in your inbox once a month, go to greatbusinessstories.supercast.com and there's a link to it in the description. Thank you. Yeah, um, and I think I think Laker um, was a bit of a swashbuckling sort of yeah. PR type person as well, so he probably got under the quote unquote establishment skin. Yeah, so so I, I'm trying to remember what the what the genesis of that sort of issue was. I can't remember, but I think there was certainly allegations of yeah. similar sort of dirty tricks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did read like he he was in trouble and he'd over expanded. He was in deep financial yeah. trouble and all that. But I don't think BA and uh, Pan Am and uh, those are was it TWA a few other airlines anyway did come together and they wore the the settlement was over price fixing of some sort. Um, Interesting. Not, yeah, where they sort of agreed to try to price them out, but I don't think they yeah, were solely yeah. responsible. But that's interesting. I, I always wondered why did they settle with Laker for so much so easily? But as you said, it's probably because of pressure was put on them to settle. Yes. Yeah. And that was because there was a perception that this court case potentially jeopardized the privatization of flotation, BA, BA. Wow. private markets. So King had gutted the business. Yeah. You know, he'd, he'd uh, taken a lot of the middle management out and. Well, that's um, it had ready and had the company good to go. Yeah. And that's to let our listeners know like the impact King did have before King came on board. Um BA the initials were jokingly referred to as standing for bloody awful. And yeah. uh, this is because of their claims were delayed all the time. There was strikes all the time. Um there was something like seventeen unions involved in the company at the time. In eighty one they were losing a hundred and forty million. So then King comes in in nineteen eighty one. Um, within two years, he's got rid of nine of the board members and replaced them with his own. Also, within two to three years, he's got rid of 40% of the staff without any union strikes, mainly because he uh, made really decent redundancy packages yeah. to them, which again shows his pragmatism. I mean, yes, he was put in there by the Tories and they would love to see him crush the unions. But I think he took a far more pragmatic view of all this and thought, no, we'll just pay them decent money and we'll cut the staff that way and th- that was one of the things i got about king as well um he does come across okay, as this grand establishment figure but in the interviews and he did a desert island interview as well i don't know mm-hmm. if you listen to that um desert no. island for our listeners is this radio show i think it's still running on the bbc yeah. and it's where the they bring on a famous business person or celebrity or whatever, and they just ask them, if you were stuck on a desert island, what music would you play? And Lord King was on it. And he comes across in a very different way. He uses words like romantic, dreamer. Really? Or, yes, I know, I know. And he also talks very much about the normal person working with BA. He said, I took on the job because he said, I thought it was doable. But Mm. I also, he said, I flew with BA an awful lot. He said, and I liked the people who worked there. They were good people. Now, I might be a bit naive, but I kind of believed him. I think he he stuck to his working class roots in a way. And he thought the only way these people are going to stay in a job is if I can cut a lot of the fat. And I do think he was a boardroom bully. He was an establishment figure. But I think there was a bit more to him than this kind of Tory tough as well. I do think he never forgot his roots. And I think it's important. Yeah, I, I just think it's important to make that point that he wasn't this totally one dimensional. But he was responsible for the Dirty Tricks campaign. And he yeah. was, by the sounds of it, an awful tough man to deal with. Yeah, but I guess there was a whole a whole sort of cadre or, or group of people who, who were in this with him. And there was... Marshall, Sir Colin Marshall, there was Robert Ayling. Um, yes. So, so, so I guess maybe he's become associated with it in a way, but in some respects, it, it's a cast of characters really that contributed to this. There was, there was. Having said that, I don't think anybody would have done anything without his say. So. Oh God, no. He was no, no, the no. boss. Yes. And I suppose that that's where we start to go to from here. So Lord King comes in in 1981. 
And then he gets in new board members, gets rid of 40% of the staff, does a lot of the sort of necessary cutting that needs to be done. And then in 1983, he appoints Colin Marshall as the CEO. And Marshall comes from Avis, the car hire company, where he made mm-hmm. a good name for himself in turning around the European operations. And together they formed a really, really good partnership. I never got the yeah. impression that they were friendly, though. Did you? I'm not sure. No, the only the only person who comes across as having any sort of friendly relationship with King is this sort of interesting, peculiar sort of security guy, uh, Ian Johnson. So they play backgammon in the club together. Oh. And that's the only person who really, it seems, King had, you know, a personal yeah. out-of-work relationship with. Um, so this is the security guy who was appointed by uh, Lord King later on in the story. But that's the only person who I've come across as having a, a relationship. Yeah. Because... Doesn't seem to have relationships like that. No. Himself and Marshall got on very, very well professionally. Like they rang each other uh, at 7.30am yes. promptly every morning to discuss the business. Marshall was very much on the marketing operations, yeah. running that side of the business. King was on the strategy and the politics side. And their main focus was on putting people first. This was their whole drive. And this was Marshall's drive as well. Transforming staff attitudes to customers and getting that message out to the public, which they did with their TV ads. The TV ads were iconic. Oh, like, was Joan Collins in one of them? or She might have been, but I'm thinking more of the ones that had the flower, what's the song? The Flower Duet ad. It's this famous music. If you hear it, it'll automatically resonate with you. Or the right. Airways ad. And it was those kind of ads and their focus on customers that managed to turn the airline round. Gotcha. I think the one with John Collins actually is set on an airplane, but it's not B8. Right. <laughs> right. It was actually Campari or one of these. Ah, things. yes, yes, yes. They used to have a few of those. Leonard, whatever. Um, yes, was, that's right. Yes. From yeah. Rising Dan. From yeah, Rising yeah, Dan. Yeah. He was on one as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I just made that mental association. They're on an airplane. It's B8. Yeah. But actually, it's for, for the drinks that we're having. So, so then 1984 and on comes Branson. Yeah. And I suppose for people who aren't familiar with Branson, um, you know, we talked about him being this big charismatic figure, big hair, yeah. big teeth, all this. But just to give you a quick background of, of where he came from, for those who aren't familiar with him. Um, now, he's very much anti-establishment. Having said that, he did come from very much a, an yes. over middle class family. He, he, he was yeah. as a a slight silver spoon in his mouth, but he was self-made and he was self-made by, at the age of 16, he started up this magazine. And even before that, I remember yeah. talking about selling Christmas trees, but he started up a magazine. Student magazine. Student magazine, was yeah. yeah. Wasn't really making money, so he decided to advertise records on the back of it. And then he yeah. sell these records by mail order. They started making money, so he opened a record shop. The record shop started making money. He started, then opened up a, a music label called virgin that's right uh, music and his very first release was a huge hit it was um mike oldfield's tubular bells and when yes. they sell like 15 million copies and mike oldfield at the time was only 19 i didn't realize that. oh my god i know i make an association in there the exorcist i think that music might have been used in the exorcist that was the reason that it was only doing okay and then the exorcist came out uh, in 1973 and sales went through the roof and then they went on to sign up the Sex, Sex Pistols, Pistols, yeah, Culture yeah. Club, Peter Gabriel, Rolling Stones. Um, and then he set up Virgin Atlantic in, in a typical entrepreneurial fashion. He was, um, uh, and you know the story as well, he was in Puerto Rico flying mm-hmm. to his private island, Necker Island in the British Virgin Islands, and yeah. his flight was cancelled. So he decided, I think he was meeting his girlfriend over there, so he obviously really wanted to meet her, so he <laughs> chartered a private plane. And then went around the airport to all the guy, people who were on his cancelled plane and said, I've chartered this, £39, and you got your yeah. seats on this. So he managed to cover his cost, and that was the start of Virgin Airways. Yeah, and I, I think coincidentally, though, hadn't hadn't the kind of the bones of the airline been kicking around in a different form as well, though? Oh, had Wasn't they? I didn't know pre- that. I think there might have been a previous, to the best of my recollection, a previous airline with original founders. But there was. Who flew to the Falklands. Yes. I think. Yeah. I, in, I remember when I was doing my research, I was thinking, I read, and it was like Virgin Atlantic was founded by, and it was two other guys that I'd never heard of. Yes. And then, it's a bit like today's equivalent to Tesla, when you think Tesla's founded by Elon Musk. Musk. 
but it wasn't. And he's indelibly associated with it. So to a certain extent, sort of that branding and marketing exercise has worked. So I think similarly with, um, with Branson, he might not technically have been the founder, although yeah. it will be nothing without him. Obviously. Yeah, but good correlation there, all right, even in the foundation there between Musk and Manson, because both of them are very, very much associated with their companies. They are the front and yes. center brand of their companies for, for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so sort of one plane, then one route. One plane, one route. Uh, it was Gatwick, Newark, 1984. Right. That was their first one. And then over the next few years, they added more planes and more routes, but still, when the shit hit the fan when this 30 tricks campaign started it yeah. was still very much a minnow like you had british airways at this stage about 180 200 planes virgin atlantic five yeah. or six planes you know but i've flown with them a couple of times with virgin I say. have you yeah i have yeah i flew to to barbados i flew to cape town with them um both from gatwick i think from memory um and it was different. It was a very different experience. Well, well it's interesting. You said, in what way was it different? Just better? So, yeah. So I think the staff were very focused on the customer, very attentive. Yeah. They were very friendly. Uh, the planes just seemed better. Yeah. They were better kiss, better entertainment system. And then I can remember the freebies that you would get. Like a blanket and an eye mask yeah. and earplugs and headphones were just more generous. And ultimately, somebody's paying for this sort yeah. of stuff. But I guess, uh, now I was in regular sort of cattle class or whatever you want to call it, but they did make you feel special. Yeah, that's interesting because I read um, Martin Sorrell or Sorrell, the former, he was with Satchi and Satchi mm. back in the 80s, but he went on to build his own advertising empire. But he mm. said the same. He said the same of Virgin back then. He said the whole experience was just better than what you got yes. anywhere else from the whole audiovisual experience. So they had movies on board that you wouldn't get. Yeah, to. the back of the headrest sort of stuff, that entertainment says. Yeah. Prior to that, it was one screen and you watched exactly. what everyone else was watching. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they did. They weren't afraid, afraid to invest, you know. They yeah. did get stuck in and invest in it. But it was, uh, yeah, yeah, even back then, I'm talking about maybe... 1999, 2000, around that time, it felt like a very different experience, special. Yeah. yeah. And um, there was an energy in the staff. It was almost as if they're on a mission. Yeah. You know? Well, I uh, mean, that was part of the reason we talked about um, how Branson got under their skin. But even strategically, from a marketing point of view, as early as 1985, BA did acknowledge that Richard Branson's, that the Virgin Airline or Virgin Atlantic, that they had a style and a flair. And that they were a bigger yes. threat to BA than all their other rivals, primarily because they were targeting and successfully targeting the younger trendsetter types who regarded Virgin yeah. as the airline to travel on. And like with anything, if you can get people in that are committed like that to your brand, that's a big yes. threat. Even though they were tiny compared to BA, there was a the threat that, wait a second, these guys are small, but if they keep growing, you know, they are a big threat to us. So, yeah, and, and they invented this first class experience with chauffeurs collecting you from okay. your hotel or from your home. Again, I didn't get to sample any, that must be said, but they would bring you to the airport. So it was very much a luxurious experience. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, they kind of invented the middle class of the flight. So a little bit better than cattle class, but yeah. not as premium. BA tried to kind of be inspired by that, but didn't pull it off as successfully. Was that so, BA's so club class or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it felt as if, you know, they were setting a standard in the market yeah, that right. other people were following. Really. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that's what gets us to why the Dirty Tricks campaign um, kicked off. It was because they saw them as credible threat. There was also yes. then, though, because the government transferred some of BA's London Tokyo routes to Virgin. This was in that's 1989. Right. Then soon after, I think around 1990, the government awarded Virgin the right to fly from Heathrow. Um, Which BA and, very much saw as their turf. Oh, Lord King was fuming a bit about this. He saw these as acts of betrayal. Yeah, I mean, they were legitimate acts by government to open up competition. And this is yeah. all part of the airline industry back then in America, in Europe. It was happening all over the place. But Lord King 
thought that these are politicians who I have backed all my life and who have backed me all my life. And these are the very people who I am giving free flights to all the time. And how dare they give these routes to Virgin? And this coincided with the change in government as well, didn't it? Yes. Didn't John Major Major become party leader at this stage? Yeah. There was an interesting anecdote where at at dawn, the time that Virgin were awarded the slots in Heathrow, in the old design of Heathrow, there was a roundabout with a copy of the Concord. Right. So BA flagship plane. Yes. And Brian Branson got in a van with a silk or material kind of cut out, climbed on top of <laughs> the, the Concorde and replaced the tail fin design with the BA, which was from BA with a Virgin brand. Yeah. Dressed up as a pirate. And uh, I think he must have driven people bananas with these kind but of But it was all those kind of stuff. And, but the thing is, you got to realize, like, he was... He had to do this as well. He didn't have yes. BA's big budgets. He did yeah. not have all this money that BA had. To He only had five or six planes at this time. But he managed to drum up all this free publicity just yeah. by putting himself front and centre. And of course... And he was ballooning and, and powerboating and doing all of these other kind of... This is, yeah, well, he had it. Well. I mean, in 1989, he had two balloon incidents. He had one on April Fool's Day where he had a balloon disguised as a UFO and flew it across London to try and scare people. Again, generating huge publicity. And then he nearly died in 1987 going across the Atlantic in a hot air balloon that was called the Virgin Atlantic Flyer. But in doing so, again, generating huge publicity. So you have yeah. BA creating these fantastic ads and spending tens of millions and doing well out of it. But you also yes. have Branson with this tiny airline, no advertising budget, but probably generating as much publicity and the kind of yeah. publicity that he wants, again, to get across this brand of cheeky anti-establishment adventurous so really being successful in that way so yeah and, we, and, and they won a lot of awards from the tourism industry and the travel industry did they so I they know. got a lot of recognition for the quality of the service and the product that they yeah. were delivering virgin right. so so you can imagine the ba establishment they think they own heathrow they think they yes. own slots and and they think they own the travel industry and yeah. this minnow is coming in and getting plaudits, recognition, um, column inches in the press. It must have been infuriating. But as you said then, the tipping point was that Kuwaiti incident or when Iraq yes. invaded Kuwait and there was all these English citizens trapped over there. And instead of the national flag carrier going over and taking the British citizens back, it was Virgin Airways. and. Yeah. Apparently, as a result of that, then, in 1991, I think it was, Lord King calls Colin Marshall and their head of PR, a guy who we haven't mentioned yet, a guy called David Burnside, into his office uh, with the instruction, and this is in quotes, do something about Branson. Yes. Yeah. And and what they did do then, these fascinating kind of uh, internal code words for you know, these campaigns that they undertook. But yeah, I mean, the first one, I, right, I've got code names for two of them, okay? But for yeah. the first one that I know about, so the, from what I can get, there was sort of three main stages to this. Yes. And the first one was where the BA helpline staff were called into a meeting room and yes. they were told, your job is no longer to help me is get on the plane, which apparently... That the helpline staff did. If you had any ticket issues or any inquiries, yes. the helpline staff would go down and see you go onto the plane and you know look after you. And they were told that's not your job anymore. Your job from now is top secret. You can't tell your friends or family about yes. this. You yeah. are going to tap into this system. Uh, to give our listeners context, there was a system called the British Airways boarding system or something like that. It was called Babs booking system. Booking yeah, system. Babs, yeah. Babs, yeah. which. Virgin and all the other airlines used as well. This is crazy back That's then. That's right. They leased us. They yeah, leased, leased capacity on us. But the BA helpline staff could illegally tap into it and get all Virgin's uh, details, all their passenger yes. information. If the plane was delayed, the numbers of people going on the plane, the class, you know, whether they were first class, business class. Was there a yep. code name for that operation? Um. Because they the others have code names, but I didn't yeah, find a so code was, name for that there part was, of it. There was Operation Covent Garden. Yes. There was Mission Atlantic. And then there was 
Operation Barbara. Yeah, the Barbara was the dirt digging one, which we'll get on to now. And yeah, I, but I, I, I don't think so, no. actually. And when I heard Operation Barbara, I thought, oh, well, this must be this one because it's where they break into the Babs system. And Babs is obviously short oh, for Barbara. Yeah. So I thought Operation Barbara. No, no, no I, I know it's not. It, it Barbara Cartland it refers to. Operation Barbara refers to Barbara Cartland. Yeah, because she would have been the writer of these bodice ripping sort of romance novels where virgins were deflowered, essentially. Okay. Okay. All right. So we'll get on to Operation Barbara in a minute. So the, the first prong of this operation anyway was where BA helpline staff, all of a sudden their ch jobs changed. They were no longer yes. helping people get on planes. They were now hacking into the Virgin uh, database and getting all these uh, vital figures. Now, part of the reason for these figures, obviously, if you know how many people are going on a plane, you know, what class they're flying yes. in and all that, BA had a good idea of Virgin's revenues, which is pretty yeah, good their load factor and stuff yes, like that. Yes, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Another good part for, from BA's point of view was that if a, if they found out that a Virgin plane was delayed, the yeah. helpline staff would contact staff on the fl on the ground called Hunters. And the Hunters' yes. job was to fan out around the airport, find the Virgin passengers whose flight had been delayed, and persuade them to go on to the BA flights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which for Virgin was a very hard thing to counter because they were so small. If their plane was delayed, they weren't able to turn around and say, oh, but we have another plane ready for you here because they were too small to do that. Whereas BA were able to just fan out and kind of say, you know, come on our plane here and talk yeah. them into doing that, which I'm sure would have a disastrous impact on a small business. Yeah, they also um, use that information to portray Virgin as being late. Yeah. So Virgin flights are delayed or they're late getting away from the gate, which wasn't true at all. It was actually um, how quickly they could turn around the gate and get people out. So they keep the gate open a little bit later, but could turn around people, get them onto the plane, get the plane off the tarmac. Yeah. So there was a kind of a little bit of funny business on massaging of those figures as well, which factored into some of the PR activities that we're putting out. So I guess the B, accessing the bad system wasn't necessarily under an operation but it did come into use in a number of different ways including the PR campaign yeah and then the other part of that operation which kind of combined with it I think you mentioned uh, Operation Atlantic was that it? Atlantic is at the same time that Virgin were becoming a serious threat there was an opening up of the skies to allow the American carriers into Heathrow right so United etc so the idea there of um, Mission Atlantic was to target specific routes and flood them with capacity. So, so essentially you were blanketing to sort of bolster yourself against com competition and then discounting heavily to try and win a share of yeah. that market. So to offset the potential. Which again would be hugely damaging to Virgin. Well, also as part of the original thing where they're all tapping into Babs is they did manage to get information. I thought that yes. was crazy. They got information of passengers, flight details and also yes. their home numbers or if they're staying in hotels, they'd know what hotels they were staying in. And what they would do is they would code call these passengers yes. and say, we know you're flying on Virgin tomorrow, but if you switch to BA, we'll throw you in you know, free flights from London to Paris as a sweetener. And like the very fact, can you imagine getting a cold call from an airline who first of all you haven't booked with, but they have your number. And then they try and talk you out of your flights to go fly with them. It's crazy. Well, it's alleged in the book, it actually became a little bit more serious than that because they rang up claiming to be from Virgin. No way. And apologizing for cancelling the flight. Oh, sneaky. And then offering to put them on a BA flight. Oh, that's and there was a, there was a couple of people mentioned in the books who were getting very frustrated with Virgin at the time. And they were saying, you know, maybe these guys are just not reliable. And they'd yeah. ring back looking for the person who'd rang them. And no person with that name existed in the call center in Virgin at all because they weren't Virgin people. Oh, that is sneaky. That is sneaky. Yeah. Because the, the, one of the stories I heard was from a, a business lady who got a call and the person did say they were from BA. And they said, look, we know you're flying Virgin tomorrow. Um, but if you switch to BA, and she was based in London herself, she said, if you switch to BA, uh, we'll give you free return trips, London to Paris and throw in a hotel and all that. And she switched, you know, she said, yeah, okay, I'll take that. 
<laughs> yeah, of course. Um, but I can't believe they also rang pretending to be from Virgin. That is so Yeah, and, and saying their flight was delayed or cancelled and putting them on to be air. At the same time, there was kind of a soft cooperation, really, between airlines. So if my flight was delayed, yeah, um, there was an arrangement that the airlines would play nicely and accommodate each other. Yeah. So say, for instance, if I had a personal situation yes. at home or to get home, you, you would accept my, say, Virgin flight onto your BA flight and that position hardened as part of this sort of. Yeah. So, okay. And you think that's bad enough. That was just one arm of yeah. their dirty tricks company. Then there's the second yeah. one, which is probably even worse again, which was called Operation Barbara. And uh, that's great context. So it was named after Barbara Cartland, the author. This is where BA hired a PR professional, a guy called Brian Basham, who's a very interesting character. So he featured yeah. on the World in Action program. And even outside of the World in Action program, I did a bit more reading on him. And this guy was a top cookie. Yes. You, know, you, you didn't mess with him at all. And if you did, I mean, the book that you read, he sued them and he successfully he won, won as well. He won yeah. as well. I mean, this guy didn't lie down for anybody. No. He was hired by BA to basically do a an exercise in finding as much damaging information as he could about Branson and about Virgin Business. And uh, he would have reported to David Burnside that. He would have reported to David Burnside, but the World in Action program also shows that not only did he report to David Burnside, but that Colin Marshall signed the invoice that paid him for this report. Uh, and the reason we say that is that, as we'll see later on, that the Virgin board said they knew nothing about any of these dirty yes. tricks campaigns. But the world in action shows clearly that uh, the CEO, Colin Marshall, signed the invoice for this guy, mm -hmm. anyway, Basham, to do this report on uh, Branson. And the report was, first of all, to be presented to the board. But of course, the other motive behind it was to leak as much damaging information yeah. from this report to the journalists. And that's what Basham did. He gathered some very damaging information. A lot of it wasn't true. It was based on rumor. Now, in his defense, yes. he would always say that when he rang the journalist with this, he said, this is just what I'm hearing, but you'll need to check this yourself. But to give you an idea of the kind of stories that mm -hmm. they put out there, one was that Virgin was running out of money to such an extent that they had to pay Shell, the fuel yes. company, in advance for each load of fuel that they were buying. Now, for any small business to have a story that you're running out of money put out there i mean first of all you have investors at the time virgin was growing they were looking for investors you can imagine potential investors hearing this story you have your creditors if you have other creditors who are hearing that you're running out of yeah, money and you're paying in advance they're all going to want money in advance yeah and finally you have your customers will you book a flight with an airline if you think this airline could be closed in the morning so yeah you'd huge. end up stranded somewhere or yeah. something yeah so an awful story, but I know in Martin Gregory's book, he probably has a lot more detail on. Yeah. And he talked a bit about Branson had a, a famous gay nightclub, Heaven. Yeah. Um, I was who, there. Were you? I was, I was, I was, right. In the nineties, I remember I was over to see my brother and Paul Oakenfold was playing there one night. Wow. So, yeah. And it was amazing. It was like, it was kicking. I don't know if it was a, a hundred percent gay nightclub by the time I got there. Uh, it was definitely still a gay nightclub, but there was a lot yeah. of straight people as well. But it was, it's a fantastic place. I don't know if it's Christ. still going. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so this but, was, but it was sort of, of, yeah, and it was huge. And, you know, it was often used as a way to discredit Branson, mm. that he was indulging sort of an alternative lifestyle. But in fairness to him, he was a very progressive guy and yeah. fought very hard and said, you know, these people are discriminated against. Why shouldn't they have somewhere yeah. fun and safe to relax? Um, and the story was put around that the council who would have collected the bins refused to collect the bags from outside of heaven um, because they were full of syringes. Yeah. So um, I and don't there's no know. there's no proof to that at all. Was no. And um, anything that you probably inject, not that I'm an expert on it, isn't conducive to having a good time in a nightclub. But yeah. night anyway. <laughs> so it's probably making a huge leap. I, um, I definitely didn't see any needles when I was in heaven. Like, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> then there was the, the, the financial health of the overall Virgin group. Yeah. 
um, was kind of hinted at around in, in these documents. Yeah. Um, there was clandestine meetings and phone calls going on as this information began to trickle out. Yeah. And Branson did run some tight businesses and kind of lean businesses, but there was no hint that there was any sort of financial jeopardy there. And in actual fact, I think in the course of, of this story, he went on to sell his music well, business. That's a, and, and that gets us to the, the crux of what happened in terms of the court case and all that, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, um, and just before the court case, there was one other element to this, which was Operation Covent Garden, which we mentioned. That was just your man that you talked about. I didn't know he was yeah, so Ian close. Johnson. Ian Johnson, who was close. I didn't know he was that close to King. Head of security, Ian Johnson, uh, BA felt that they might have a mole. They were right. Yeah, that's King right. Mass, you know, because uh, <laughs> as we'll find out, that's exactly how Branson found out about this. So they set up another operation whereby they sent out private investigators to go through the rubbish of BA staff and a Times journalist. His rubbish was went through. So just bizarre stuff. Um, they thought there were bugs. Yes. As well. Did so they think they were bugs as well? Bugs. Yeah. And then a re- tape recording landed on Branson's doorstep, which in fairness he declared. Right. And that was a recording, I think, of Marshall having a discussion maybe with Ailing, I can't remember. And then this kind of fired up that paranoia as well. But these are sort of ex-military types. Yeah. Um, kind of going off clandestine meetings, meeting people in pubs up the country, um, thinking they're being followed yeah. and getting paranoid. And of course, again, significant expense encouraged yeah. for this exercise. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it all comes to a crux because there's all this activity happening. Uh, Virgin offices are starting getting phone calls from journalists, start to saying, can you confirm this story? Can you confirm yes. that? And they're going, where is all this coming from? What well, they knew something was up. And then you have VA staff that have some conscience. Eventually, they come to Branson with this and they start to say, yes, that's this, right. this is happening. You know, they, you're right. You're not being paranoid because a lot of people were start saying to Branson, you are being paranoid. BA themselves were gaslighting Branson saying, oh, this is all just part of self-promotion on his part. But Branson yes. was right. And he had BA staff come to him and confirm this is actually happening. So he sent a letter to the board of BA saying, look, these are the allegations that I know are happening. And what are you going to do about it? So again, in all this, Branson just seemed to have acted in a very, very fair, even-handed, proper way until such time as he sent that letter to BA. And BA, first of all, dismissed it out of hand, said there's nothing yeah. to these allegations at all. And then BA compounded it by releasing an article in their weekly newsletter. where That's they basically, right, BA News. Yeah, yeah where they, they basically said, this is all part of self-promotion on Branson's part because that's what Branson does. He's just a self-promoter. Again, the biggest form of corporate gaslighting that you ever saw. Yes. And Branson used that article. It was that article. That's right. That he for libel. For libel. So he said, yes. okay, yeah, I've got you for libel here. And BA countersued and uh, That's right. thought that they could brazen it out. And I, I think he would have ultimately preferred, certainly the book implies that he would have preferred to have settled this. Yes. Or I court, think he would. Or before going to court at all and just try and kind of trade in, you know, a competitive but gentlemanly manner. I think you're right because um, that's why I think he sent the letter. And it also comes down to the fact that, as you said, he needed to sell his company to take this action, really. But why yes. we get to that, BA tried to brazen it out. Lord King's MO was to be a bit of a bully. And they probably thought that the struggling Virgin Airline wouldn't have the resources. And they didn't, in a way, accept the fact that Branson had Virgin Records. Yeah. And he sold it. To take this action, he sold it. And I think that was the defining part. It showed BA that I'm not going to be bullied here. I, uh, yes. If I have to sell my baby to fight this, I'm going to sell it. And he sold it for just under a billion dollars. So it was a lot of money. Yeah. He was very obsessed about doing this. As he said, I read articles with him where he was yes. crying having to do it. But he wasn't going to be bullied. And that was it. And I thought that was very admirable. But it also really put BA in their place. And they knew then, OK, we're, he's got us here. Yeah. He's got us. Yeah. And at the same time, I think he, he was he was exploring avenues for expansion himself, wasn't yeah, he? So he was. He was looking at he was. Know, potential flotations or trade sales and partnerships. He was. And as, as well. you said, he had a load of other businesses that he was starting up around this time. So 
Sterling Virgin Music um, probably allowed him to fund all this. But I think the uh, reason for doing it primarily was yeah. uh, to, to fight this case. He knew that if he fought it without selling uh, Virgin Music, he could be in big financial trouble. So he sold. And I think on the day before they were meant to go to court or the day they were going to go to court, um, yeah. BA knew that their goose was, goose was cooked rather and they um, were forced into one of the most humiliating climb downs in corporate history. Yeah, and I think it might have been the biggest, uh, to that point, the biggest libel settlement in history. Yeah, Certainly it was. History. They had to pay Branson 500,000. They had to pay his airline yes. 100,000. But they also had to pay legal costs of, of 3 million. That's um, right. And it was. And then Branson money. distributed the money that he was awarded personally yeah. to his staff and called it the BA bonus. Exactly. And front pages all that day or the next day were all about this case. I remember yes. seeing one headline. It had Lord of the Lies rather than Lord of the Skies. <laughs> big picture of Lord King. So this was really humiliating for them. Yes. It was huge. And and their the personal repercussions for them? Well you know, one really, would assume loads of heads rolled, but that actually that didn't, didn't happen. happen. That didn't happen. BA, even though they settled, they still sent out a statement saying that their board of directors knew nothing about this, which as we yes. saw wasn't true. Marshall did sign the invoice. Uh, Ailing, who became the CEO a few years down the line, was directly involved in, with Basham in spreading these stories. But what happened really was Lord King moved from chairman to a newly created role of president. Colin yeah. Marshall stayed on, I think, as CEO for another few yes, years. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. And Robert Ailey yeah. moved up to become managing director. Um, but nothing much changed for them in that way. The only people who I think bit the bullet was um, their PR guy, Burnside, was fired yes. with a £500,000 yeah. payoff. And I think he also got free flights for four years or something That's like right. that. That's right. Yeah. Deal. And Basham kind of went off as well, didn't he? I think he was only a contractor, really. He was only a contractor. I think he was a Burnside's right-hand man, but he was That's an outside right. man. Um, yeah. So, but, he's actually, but, he's, he's went on to various different successes. Most recently, he was a um, spokesperson for Ghislaine Maxwell. Was he? So you'd see him popping up in, in the yeah. press. So he's definitely a, a street fighter. But I mean, at yeah. the end of it all, yeah, you can say they went on with their lives. But when you look at it, Lord King... Yes, he was the poster boy for the Tory government. He saved yeah. the business. But wherever you read about him, wherever you read about him, the Dirty Tricks campaign follows him like a bad smell, you know. Yeah, and he did see, he, he did consider BA to be the crowning achievement of his yeah. career in terms of the turnaround and and the flotation. Branson still, I, I was just reading about him, he's worth 3.2 billion. He's got his hands in a lot of different pies. Mm. He's doing well, but I thought it was just a, a fascinating story. I really liked it. One of the most interesting anecdotes was after all of this, the license for the British uh, National Lottery was coming back up. Right. I don't know this and one. This Go was on. something that Branson wanted um, to, to kind of secure because he was convinced that there was too much fat in the organization and too many senior people were getting rich yeah. on the lottery. And he had a different structure in mind. So one of the people who he recruited, interestingly enough, to join his bid for the lottery was none other than Colin Marshall. You're chill. Um, so, so they were going to go in at this together. Now, at the end, Colin Marshall didn't have the capacity in his um, kind of business life. He had other commitments that were yeah. going to hold him back from it. But it speaks to, to, to Branson's pragmatism, which is actually a characteristic that you were discussing. Which With King, King had, yeah. So maybe that's the story here. He sold this beloved version of music. He could reach across the aisle to call it Marshall. And wow. then he he ends up send, selling 49% of this um, airline to, uh, I think it was Singapore Airlines. So a very pragmatic set of people. Very who, much so, um, yeah. yeah I, and settling outside of the court at yeah. the end of the story is another sign of pragmatism on both of us, really. Yeah. Yeah, my one takeaway from all this, just don't pull any shady shit. It's never worth it. When you see, like, Branson was so upfront, yeah, he annoyed them, he got under their noses, but mm. everything he did was upfront. Whereas BA went through this shady stuff of just trying to steal customers, black in yes. somebody's name. It's never worth this. It always just sure. comes back to bite you in the arse ten times. Or don't get caught, maybe. <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's the other story. Uh, Anyway, cool. okay, great story. Good chat. 
I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, I am. I'll get back to you with that. All right. Perfect. Peter. All right. Talk to you. Take care. Cheers. See you. Bye. bye. bye.